Welcome back, everyone. It's such a blessing to be with you today. Well, today, Dr. Russell Blaylock is joining us. We're going to talk about neurological threats to our health and to our brain. This is going to be amazing. We'll be surprised to learn some common things, some things we all encounter every day, things we eat, things in our environment, things that we do to ourselves, and how it affects our neurological health. Dr. Blaylock, thank you so much thank for you. coming back today. Thank you, thank you for this joining is us, so Doctor. It's always a pleasure. Mm. You know, most of us think of the uh, mental condition, the brain condition, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, uh, yeah, dementia, this type of thing, as, as though there's nothing that can be done. Some of us are just affected with senility. You know what I'm mm -hmm. trying to say? And that if it happens, it happens. Maybe it's all genetic. But you've learned from your research that that's not necessarily true, is it? Well, exactly. You know, this is sort of the same thing we thought about heart attacks and strokes and atherosclerosis. Well, mm -hmm. it's just inevitable. Yeah. My father had it when 40. Yeah, it know, runs in the attack, family. So I'm going to have it too. I'm just going to eat, drink, and be merry. Yeah. Uh, well, we found that wasn't true. You can change it. But what we've discovered is even if you have genetic propensity for neurological diseases, Alzheimer's, you can change it. That your diet, changes in diet, certain supplements can turn these genes off or the effect of the genes can be changed so that your risk is far, far uh, less than it would be otherwise. And you can live a normal, healthy life uh, into mm -hmm. your 80s or even 90s. So Dr. Blaylock, if, let's just say that that was something that ran in maybe my grandparents. I knew that both my grandparents had Alzheimer's or some, one of these neurological diseases. Is that something I would want to prevent now? Oh, absolutely. Because all of these diseases begin decades before any clinical oh. uh, appearance. Decades before. Decades. Decades. So from childhood up, we need to be right. paying attention. Okay. Just like atherosclerosis. Right. When we look at hardening of their arteries, it begins in childhood. No way. Right. In childhood? Right. When they've done autopsies on babies and small children, they see these fatty streaks. And by the time they're teenagers, the fatty streaks have changed into full-blown atherosclerosis. By the time they're in their 40s, they're beginning to get advanced atherosclerosis. So these things all start as, as children and, and adolescents and and uh, early uh, adulthood. Can, can we be specific about what types of conditions we're talking about? Now, I mentioned Alzheimer's disease, but what else are we speaking of? Well, Alzheimer's is the big one. Yes. We know that at least 10 years, maybe 20 years, or even longer, before we ever develop any symptoms of memory loss or disorientation, we begin to have the changes in the brain that's gonna lead to it. Mm -hmm. One of the principles of neurological injury is, you don't really develop any symptoms till you've lost at least 80 to as much as 90 percent of that particular area of your brain. Well, so well, even with 10 percent, it takes that much and 20 percent really? functioning. So you, you're right. well into it before there's right. any symptoms right. of it. So by the time you develop symptoms, you've already lost yeah, it's, about 80 percent. It's hard. Of can't go back then function. at that point. But right? you can go back. You can. Okay. Because a lot of these cells aren't necessarily dead; they're just not functioning. They're just gone up into to hibernation kind right. of. Right. And okay. so if you change the nutrients, if you change uh, the toxins, remove them, uh -huh. uh, these cells can start coming back to their normal health and function again. Would this include things like Parkinson's and what about multiple sclerosis? Now, I don't want to cast too broad of a net and generalize, but I think for most of us, even doctors, the MS, the Parkinson's and whatnot, it, it's very mysterious to, to most all of us as to how these happen and how we can prevent them. Well, it's, it's the same story we talked about in a previous program about cancer. Yeah. If we look at the neurological diseases, almost all of them are, uh, have as their central cause inflammation, chronic inflammation. This is what we learned about Alzheimer's disease. Almost all the research now says this is an inflammatory disorder. Okay. The question is what causes the inflammation? Uh -huh. When we look at Parkinson's disease, we see it's a different set of neurons or parts of the brain that are affected, but they're inflamed question is, what makes that particular part of the brain become inflamed? Lou Gehrig disease, the same thing. It's a different part of the nervous system, but it's inflammation that led to it. Uh, so now we're beginning to search out what causes this inflammation. So as I understand it, 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 whether we're talking about Lou Gehrig's, Parkinson's, whatever it is, we're really talking about an inflammatory state. Right. And if we take steps as early as possible in our diet, in our exercise patterns, and in supplements we take, we can have an effect right. on these endpoint diseases. Did I get that right? Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Particularly the diet. 
the diet? More and more we're beginning to learn that diet does some important things. It programs our genes early in life mm -hmm. as to whether those genes are going to be expressed See, or th not expressed. this is fascinating. You're saying that what we eat affects our genetic yeah. Not material? Not only what we eat, but as a child. All the way so back. important right. to right. what we it, feed it our kids. It begins programming very early. For instance, they looked at DHA feeding to animals that were very young. Uh, and they followed it up with some human studies and found out if, if you feed them DHA early in life, it dramatically reduces their breast cancer when they become adults. Now, what's really? DHA? What uh, is that? It's uh, docohexyanic acid, which is a part oh, of the omega-3 The omega-3s, okay. And it will program those genes for breast cancer so that it can dramatically reduce breast cancer decades later. Well, we find the same thing with neurological diseases. If you change the diet or start out the diet in the child very early, it'll program those genes so they won't develop that Parkinson's or that Alzheimer's later in life. Hmm. And this is the exciting thing in, in what we call uh, uh, dietary genetic intervention. Yeah. A and it's good hard science demonstrating this, that genes turn on and off and that hmm. your diet can determine whether a bad gene is on or off or a good gene is on yeah. and off. Yeah. So you're saying that you may have the genes, but the diet can turn them can on turn them or off. turn them right. off. Exactly. Now, you have joined us on previous occasions and discussed excitotoxins. And I want to connect excitotoxins to the Alzheimer's, the Lou Gehrig's, the, 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 the brain diseases. That Do they play a role in this too? Now, we mentioned nutrition, but what about these excitotoxins? Well, this is what uh, is really the, the vanguard of all of these studies. They're discovering that virtually everything that happens in the nervous system, strokes, uh, brain trauma, uh -huh. various diseases, degenerative brain diseases like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, Lou Gehrig, they're all excitotoxic diseases, plays a major role. Mm -hmm. And that if you reduce that excitotoxicity, you stop the progress of that disease. If you stop it early, you never develop the disease. And that's, that's the lesson that we've learned. Well, we've learned that there's a lot of simple ways to do that. Uh, just like everything we, we we're beginning to learn in medicine, it's not as complicated as we thought. The mechanism yes. are very complicated, but the prevention oftentimes is quite simple. For instance, most strokes are prevented if we increase our magnesium to, uh, intake. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That is, there's strong correlation. Now, if we look at people who develop migraine headaches as adults, uh, particularly if they have visual phenomenon associated with it, they have a very high incidence of having a stroke. Both yeah. disorders are due to magnesium deficiency. Mm. Magnesium deficiency. So we know that in, in the migraine patient, mm. Mm -hmm. they have a magnesium deficiency. We also know that even in between their attacks, their glutamate levels in their spinal fluid and brain is very high. Yeah. And that when they have the attack, it really goes up. Well, that connects it to the stroke because we know when you have a stroke, brain glutamate levels go up tremendously. Yeah. And so there are steps that we can take to minimize this effect, right. correct? The magnesium. If you just magnesium. take the magnesium, it cures most people with migraine and it, it'll prevent most strokes. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. But you have to also stop your dietary intake. Now, I think what we should do is we should go to the break a little early here. But when we come back, now we've been talking about brain diseases, but I want to ask you about diseases of the mind, like schizophrenia. What about attention deficit hyperactivity disorder? Are there things that we may be doing to ourselves inadvertently, uh, toxins that we're exposed to, this type of thing that, you know, when we think of schizophrenia, we think that, well, this is something that you're, you have and there's nothing we can do, maybe give you drugs to numb you up, but that's it. But you found some research that suggests Otherwise, correct? Correct. All right, let's talk about that when we return. <laughs> 